This is NFL Action, and I'm Pat Summerall. Until 1968, winning the AFL championship was like climbing a hill, only to stand in the shadow of a mountain. But this year, climbing the hill was harder than climbing the mountain. For the AFL championship, in retrospect, became the most important game of the year, as it would, in the end, produce pro football's world champion. Absolutely. It's quick. Four years. You know, it took a long time coming. Four years. You want to win every year. First year on. Winning. Nothing else matters to me. Winning. Whether I catch one or ten. Nothing else matters. At the time, I thought it was just a fumble, so I reached down, picked it up, and took off. We were just happy to get the ball. Has there been a key this year? There are about 50 strong hearts out here. That's where the key was. Jet Woolley had said, called up there today. Jet Woolley. For the thousands who came, for the millions who viewed, the AFO championship seemed to offer a predictable struggle. The league's two best quarterbacks would match passes, while their respective coaches would match strategies. The game would be predictable in some ways, bizarre in others. But as the tension grew for the opening kickoff, one thing was clear. If the AFO championship was to be a mere prelude to Miami's Super Bowl, it would indeed be a stunning prelude. prolific offense in pro football. He would have liked to have scored early, but the Oakland Raiders found it impossible to do anything in their first offensive series as New York's defense dealt them a telling psychological blow in round one. Like a school of sharks, the Jets' offense struck swiftly, as swiftly as Oakland had been stopped. Joe Namath to Don Maynard for a first down. Matt Snell over left tackle for six. Namath to Maynard again, 14 yards and a touchdown. On the play, Maynard had been aided by his own muddy field. Defender George Atkinson slipped as Maynard made his cut, and the Jets' flanker made the catch unmolested. It was quick and it was easy, but it would be their only touchdown for nearly three quarters of the game. Oakland's second series was as fruitless and as frustrating as its first. Drop passes would not be uncommon. Freezing temperatures and 50 mile per hour gusts made it difficult for either team's receivers to hold the ball. Yet fate somehow dealt the Raiders more than their fair share. A pass that tipped off the hands of Fred Bolitnikoff was one in a series of near misses that would haunt Oakland long after the final gun. This attempted field goal that followed was yet another. The rest of the first quarter was a struggle for both teams, characterized by grudging defensive play and the inaccurate passing of both quarterbacks. The teams exchanged the ball eight times and could collectively muster only two first downs. Through all the wind-blown passes and flying bodies, it was evident that the Raiders were flat. They were playing as dead as this punt that rolled to a halt deep in New York territory. From here, late in the quarter, 
Joe Namath went to his ground game in hopes of adding another touchdown to his 7-0 lead. But after Boozer and Snell took him to the Raiders 25, Namath's arm betrayed him. The Jets would have to settle for a field goal from Jim Turner and a 10-0 first quarter lead. Through the first quarter, viewers had not yet seen what they had expected. A battle of the league's best receivers, their complex formations and patterns. There was Don Maynard, number 13, who had scored the game's only touchdown and had been wide open on other occasions in the first period. But in the second quarter, Atkinson would play him tight and tough and would hold Maynard to one insignificant catch. Then there was the Raiders' great receiver, number 25, Fred Boletnikoff. Boletnikoff had been shut out and intimidated by New York's fiery cornerback, Johnny Sample, in the first period. While Sample may have won the fight, Boletnikoff won the war. Number 25 would lead the Raiders to their first score early in the second period. Quarterback Darrell LaMonica relied heavily on Bolitnikoff during the touchdown drive. He and number 35, set back Hewitt Dixon, were to be LaMonica's only effective weapons, however, throughout the game. After Dixon's 20-yard run with a flare pass, Bolitnikoff again broke loose in the secondary for the Raiders' initial score. A repeat of the play shows Bolitnikoff's pattern contained neither great moves nor great speed. All he did was avoid an attempted tackle and an attempted trip by two Jet defenders, neither of which seemed to phase him. Down by three, the Raiders had finally seen their first ray of sun. The touchdown must have given Oakland's defense an emotional lift for the ensuing jet drive. They blocked Namus' passes. They broke down his iron pocket and forced him to scramble on two fragile knees. And they took him to the soggy ground for the first and only time in the game. Not only did they stop Broadway Joe, they stopped his entire game plan by containing the running of Emerson Boozer and Matt Snell and preventing the long bomb to his deep receivers. A completion to number 83, George Sauer, did keep the drive going. But on a third down play, a pass to tight end Pete Lamons fell far short of a first and Jim Turner had to salvage the drive with a field goal. The Raiders were now confident that even when Namath was on target, they could prevent him from scoring a touchdown. Broadway Joe would ultimately shatter this confidence. On the following kickoff, the Raiders received their only real break of the game. George Atkinson seemingly fumbled, but the whistle blew the ball dead and Oakland retained possession. LaMonica quickly moved his team into New York territory, again having success with a flare pass to Dixon. Here marked the beginning of what was to be the key to defeat for the Raiders. Their inability to cross the goal line once inside the Jets 20. This was the first of five such opportunities in the game. All but one would fail. George Blanda's field goal made it 13-10 with only minutes left in the half. There 
would be no more scoring for either team. Oakland got the ball back, but the whistle ended the half with LaMonica awaiting the snap and the Jets awaiting the third quarter, ahead by three points. The first half had seen both teams erratic, in which neither offense was able to control the ball for long periods of time. But the tenor of the game would change radically in the third quarter. The Jets would have the ball twice, the Raiders only once. Oakland's defense was charged up for the third quarter, and they stopped the Jets' goal after the kickoff. But their efforts were negated when Roger Bird fumbled the punt return right into Bake Turner's hands. Unruffled by a seemingly fatal turn of events, the Raiders' defense closed the door on Namus' offense. From his own six-yard line, LaMonica would again take the Raiders to the brink of New York's goal line, and he would do it exclusively through the air. Oakland's ground game by now had become ineffectual, but Belitnikov was unstoppable. The last play was not only dependent on Belitnikov's catch and breakaway move for its success. His co-receiver, number 81, Warren Wells, laid a crushing crossbody block on safety Jim Hudson that afforded Bolitnikov extra yardage. Used mainly as a decoy until now, Wells then turned receiver on the next play, and the Raiders would have a first and goal on the sixth. But the Jets' defense refused to budge. Jim Hudson made three straight tackles, and the Raiders could move only to the two. Now midway through the period, Coach Rouch refused to gamble on fourth and two. Blanda's field goal tied the score at 13. The rest of the third quarter belonged to Joe Namath. On a brilliantly executed, time-consuming drive that would take seven minutes, Namath engineered his team 80 yards to a touchdown. How did he do it? Namath did it by making four crucial third-down plays to keep the drive going. He first hit Emerson Boozer, sprung free by Sowers' screen block for 12 yards and a first down. He then utilized the running of Matt Snell, who gained 25 yards on this drive and made the second crucial third down play. He took advantage of a play that almost ended the drive, a near interception. He hit John Maynard on a third and nine play with a perfect pass good for another first down. And finally, he made the big play, the touchdown. Again on a third down call. A flat pass to tight end Pete Lamons, who rolled into the end zone and gave the Jets a 20 to 13 lead at the end of the third quarter. For the first time since early in the game, Joe Namath had shown how devastating he and the Jets offense could really be.
15 minutes to play and a touchdown behind, the Raiders again ease their way into the shadow of the Jets' end zone. Belitnikov beat Johnny Sample for 57 yards soon after the quarter began. On the last play, Sample went for an early fake that allowed the Raiders receiver a step. But Sample made a good recovery after the catch to prevent a touchdown. Then it would happen again. For the third time in the game, the Jets defense met LaMonica's challenge and denied the Raiders their goal line. The tragedy for Oakland on this third down play was that Wells had sneaked free behind the secondary, but the pass instead went to Dixon and was easily batted away and almost intercepted by Jim Hudson. The Jets gave up three points but had prevented seven, which must have disheartened the Raiders. Namath then made his only mistake of the game as he was intercepted by George Atkinson. Only a rare tackle by Namath himself saved a score. <laughs> Namath's mistake on the pass was obvious. He hung the ball up a hair too long and Atkinson had a good angle to easily steal the pass away from Maynard. <laughs> This time, the Raiders made good their challenge. Pete Banaszak sliced through the line and into the end zone. The decision not to use Banaszak more often in the game hurt the Raider attack. He demonstrated a singular ability to break tackles, and here gave Oakland their first and last lead of the game, 23 to 20. Joe Namath awaited the ensuing kickoff with anticipation. He had eight minutes to regain the lead. It would take him exactly 68 seconds. Earl Christie's return set Namath up at the 32-yard line. First and 10, George Sauer on a quick sideline pattern for a first down. On the play, defender Willie Brown was protecting against the long pass, and Sauer easily made the catch. Then it was Don Maynard's turn. Maynard made a great over-the-shoulder catch 52 yards away, and the Jets were suddenly at the Raider 12. Maynard appeared to have bobbled the catch but a replay will show that he did have possession for the required length of time on a magnificent effort that set up the winning touchdown. refused to probe the defense. He went directly for a score. Seeing George Sauer covered, Namath slipped, regained his balance, and fired a rifle pass to Don Maynard through three defenders for the crucial touchdown of the game. Namath and Maynard have proved themselves as poised a combination under pressure as the AFL had ever seen. Thus far, a tense and exciting game, the drama had only just begun. Following New York's go-ahead touchdown, the Raiders again quickly approached the Jets' goal line. But again, they could not unlock the door. On 
fourth down and with six minutes to play, Rauch this time chose to disdain the field goal. The strategy backfired. The man who made the last play was Verlin Biggs, number 86, who came crashing in from the right to end another Raider threat. Time and opportunity were now slipping away from the silver and black. With three minutes left, another opportunity and another failure would come to haunt the Raiders. Passes to Bolitnikov and Wells, plus a piling on penalty, gave them a first down on the 12. Monica called for a flare pass to set back Charlie Smith. A good call in this situation, but the play was executed poorly. Considered a free ball, but not advanceable, the Jets took possession at the point of recovery, and with it took the last real hope of victory from Oakland. bears at their own funeral, the Raiders and their coach silently watched New York run out the clock. Fate dealt its last blow to Oakland when on third down, Boozer's fumble gracefully bounced back into his own hand. Yet a courageous defense had contained the Jets, and Oakland would have one final chance. With all their timeouts gone, only a miracle could save the Raiders, the kind that had occurred six weeks earlier in the Heidi Bowl. Today, that miracle would not come. to the bitter end, the final play must have seemed like an eternity. At 3.30 Eastern Standard Time, a champion was crowned. The Jets had closed the door on Oakland's offense when it had counted most and well deserved their first league title. For the Raiders, it was a heartbreaking loss that would be remembered for a long time. But as the sun began to fade behind Shea Stadium's west wall, others would remember a game that produced pro football's world champion.